I'm so used to saying welcome to <laughs> so welcome to today's live stream and it's not what you're thinking <laughs> it's what I've been saying for 93 days in a row seeing if we're gonna adjust this focus slightly all right so today's topic is gonna be about refugiums because I don't think we've talked about that uh, recently and a refugium is a zone or a section of your sump or even a separate vessel nearby so we'll talk about that here in a few moments. I wanted to remind you that next weekend there will be no live stream because I will be at Aquashella on Saturday and Sunday. So if you are in the Dallas area within driving distance, you should come. And uh, I saw a video from George saying that it's such a popular show, it'll sell out. And he was saying, buy the ticket right now. Don't wait till the last minute. So it's almost the last minute. There's one week to go, but uh, still a chance for you to go. The benefit of Aquashella is that you get to see all kinds of corals. Um, you'll probably see some fish. You will definitely see a lot of freshwater stuff. You'll see a lot of art. Uh, there's this whole, usually there's this foyer you go through that's just glow in the dark. It's fantastic. And I, that's probably, <laughs> probably my favorite part because it's so fake. It's just, it's like going into Avatar or, you know, one of those worlds. It's, it's beautiful. So I really enjoy hanging out in there for a little bit. Usually it's, you know, like I said, it's got black lights. It's probably got some fog, some mist, whatever. And, you know, all these cool displays, like there would be a pond and there would be a bridge and there'd be glowing light and there'd be like a school of fish going across the wall that are glowing and all this really neat stuff. And if you haven't seen any videos of Aquashella yet, you know, search YouTube. I shared one. I know that several others did. You can kind of find out about it and uh, hopefully you can come. And on Sunday, I'll be giving a talk about the Reef Reset. So I think that's at two o'clock on Sunday. I'm not positive, but that sounds about right. So if you are coming one day, maybe that's the day to come and we can hang out. Um, I see we've got a bunch of people in here. I don't know if the notifications worked. Uh, Andrea said, let's see if notifications work this time, but I hope they do. And uh, I tried to shoot for 208. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if I'm off slightly, I'm off slightly. That's okay. I'm, I was just dialing in the last f-stop on the camera to make sure it was perfect for this moment. I set up my table super tall. I don't know if you can tell, but it's, I mean, here are my hands, and I go down about four inches. That's my table. I'm like a, like a kid at the kid's table where the table is way too tall for the child. But I thought this would be kind of cool to run it really, really crazy high and keep my screen at high so I can see your chat. And uh, there's no other news. Uh, I just wanted to say that when I got up today and I'm looking at my tank and I was just thinking, man, the water's so clear. And I was thinking, now, is it clear because I changed the carbon and so I wanted to be clear? Or is it clear because the carbon did such a good job overnight? Which it's possible. It's been running for 12 hours or so, 14 hours. I don't know, something like that. But it's going in at a trickle. So it's coming out at a trickle. So it'd take a while to move all the water of my system through it. But man. The water just looks so clear to me. <laughs> so I am very happy with the way the tank looks right now. I try to take some pictures and video. It never does it any justice. It just never looks like reality, but I try my best to come as close as I can. Um, I wanted to say that, um, you know, 93 reef diaries in a row, I've tried to change it up each day. I, I try not to do the same thing every single day, like stand in front of the camera, just talk for five minutes you know I, that was the very first video and I even had a person comment like uh hopefully you'll show us things and not just talk to us I'm like no no of course not that was just me introducing the reef diary series but like last night I kind of filmed all these little snippets I don't know if you've watched it yet but um it kind of gave you that first person perspective of you know doing something I would love it if I could just like take my iPhone and glue it to my chest and just walk around and let it film what I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> that would be so much more convenient than trying to do things with one hand while filming with the other hand. Uh, that's always a, a whole ordeal. But uh, I thought it was kind of fun. Eventually I'll run out of cool ideas and it'll become, I don't know, we'll see. It, it, I don't want it to be boring. I don't want it to, you know, I like to keep changing it up a little bit. But eventually every trick in my book will have been used up, especially when you're doing one every single day. So, uh, but yeah. Uh, next weekend is Halloween. So hopefully everyone is stocking up on candy. I already filled up my Mickey Mouse scary pumpkin. I got this as a gift from a friend, actually. I loved it. I saw it at Disney World and I was like, man, I need this. And my friend surprised me by shipping it to me. It just came in this giant box. So I filled it up with all kinds of candy, which is really for me. 
because I won't be here to give out candy for Halloween because I'll be at Aquashella. Uh, I heard there is going to be two contests for costumes, one for children and one for adults. And uh, I believe I read that the prize was $5,000 in merchandise. So dressing up for Halloween would be worth it this year. Uh, I've got a couple of ideas of what I'd like to do, but I haven't done anything. And what's going to happen is I'm going to run out of time. So we'll see. But I'd yeah, we'll see. Um, all right, let's just do the topic. So refugiums. The point of a refugium is to grow macroalgae usually. That is the plan. And people say, well, what's better, the refugium, the algae turf scrubber, a catamorpha reactor? Well, they're all three different things. They all do different things. They, they, have, they serve different purposes. So I would say the refugium is, I'd like to say it's the oldest one. I think, I mean, there were turf scrubbers over in Australia for a while there back in the early 2000s and possibly before then, but it didn't come over to America. You know, when you saw someone talk about it, you're like, what are you talking about? And it just never, no one did it. And then one day, boom, they were like, algae turf scrubbers, they're everywhere. And I was thinking, how did that suddenly become a thing? Which is, let's just say that was six years ago. I don't remember the exact date, but I remember it just came on all of a sudden. And one person said the patent ran out and now anyone can make it. I was like, oh, okay, that makes more sense why now it's suddenly here. When all this time no one was doing it except for people in Australia. And again, if I don't have this exactly right, it's my interpretation of the events that transpired. So the algae turf scrubber is a method of running water over a screen and lighting it from one or two sides to grow algae. And there were people in the last, you know, 15 years that made their own, but you couldn't just buy them. Now there's literally companies called algeeturfscrubber.com and stuff like that. And, you know, you know, I'm running one under my tank. Uh, the ketomorpha reactor is probably the newest product, which was a big thing by Pax Bellum, and they made a patent about it. And it's this big white tube. And inside it, you would grow ketomorpha on these trays that are inside the reactor. And you lowered this, basically a lightsaber down inside the center that would glow light out. But it would trap the light within the reactor. So you weren't being bothered by extra light. And you could have this big tall thing next to your sump, water would flow in, water would flow out, and it would grow ketomorpha. And the idea was that once a month, you'd open it up and you'd take out all the plants and leave behind little wisps of plant and it would grow again. And you just do this over and over. But the refugium, I feel, has been around the longest. And the refugium is a refuge from predators. And the point of it is to have this thing, this vessel, this container, or this zone of your entire sump where you can grow macroalgae, you can grow and, and feed pods that are live food for your aquarium, and um, that's it. <laughs> you would just harvest plants out of there. And people do all kinds of stuff to make the plants grow as much as possible. Whether they used Calerpa or they used Ketomorpha or they used uh, Ulva. Some people didn't even put plants in. They put Zinnia in there. And they would just grow tons and tons because they said it was helping to filter out and remove nitrate from the water. Uh, I never knew... I mean, like I knew like three people that did it with Zinnia, so I don't know how effective that was, but they enjoyed having the pulsing Zinnia just doing this all inside that zone down under their tank. So it was kind of cool. But I remember some people would literally grow what looked like a brick of Ketomorpha, and they would just lift out this rectangle. And you're just like, wow, how did you do that? Because a lot of people could not grow it that way. And the basic premise of Ketomorpha is going to be a lot of light, and the the thing that so many people emphasize was that it should be tumbling. Well, it doesn't tumble in a reactor, but it's growing. And not everyone can set up a situation where the water will do this to create uh, a tumbleweed uh, effect with their catamorpha. So I don't know if tumbling is that critical. I understand the premise, especially if it keeps turning over and over. The plant will get light on all sides, so you won't have die-off underneath in the shade. You'll have, you won't have growth only at the top, or even have the top turn bone white and die because it's constantly moving. But setting it up to actually turn is somewhat of a challenge, and there's a couple of different techniques people have used. Uh, for me, I have never had luck with Ketomorpha. I have been a Calerpa guy since the beginning. I only lost Calerpa twice uh, in the early, early, early year. I'm not even gonna say years, probably early year of using it. And one of them was because I had this nudibranch. 
that was green. It's on my Critter ID section of my website, or Creature ID of my website. And it was this green thing that would just crawl up the stem of the Calerpa and then put its fangs into it and suck out all the green. And uh, the worm would be bright green, but the plant would turn clear. And within 72 hours, it would just completely collapse and fall apart, and it just didn't exist. It, it, it just... Uh, it did like the vampires doing Vampire Diaries where you hit them and they just turn to dust and just shatter. <laughs> and that's what was, I was like, okay, that's what the heck is going on with my Calerpa? Why does it keep dying? And it was a stupid worm. And uh, I blamed the fish store, of course, at that time because they sold me this with that worm knowing I'd have to keep going back and spending 20 bucks each time I needed some more macroalgae. And I thought that was a huge scam and I didn't like it. But uh, I got rid of the worm or I gave it back to the store and said, you can feed your worm. I'm not feeding your worm. And uh, I, then I started growing, uh, I think I start with Calerpa numillaria, which kind of looks like grape Calerpa. And that one is really prone to going sexual. And what that means is it can release a lot of green into the water. And again, the plant turns clear and then it just dissolves. And you have this basically a tank that looks like it's full of phytoplankton for temporarily, you know, overnight. Uh, and the solution was to run the light 24 seven and then the plant would never do it. It just couldn't. I don't know why. It just somehow it inhibited it from doing that. And you could grow this Calerpa without even worrying about it. And the plants are just continuing to grow and grow. But the reality is photosynthesis is a specific duration of a daily cycle. And normally plants and other things too, but we're going to stay with plants, need about six to seven hours of sunlight or daylight. And then it's done. It can't do any more photosynthesis. They cannot do it. And at that point, it just, it's exhausted. It has translated energy into sugars. It has done the thing and it kind of goes into a stagnant mode and then it'll resume again when it wants to. But it's not like you can just suddenly make photosynthesis happen 24 hours a day. That's not how things work. It doesn't work in algae, it doesn't work in plants. It doesn't work in real life either. So having your light on 24 hours a day isn't necessarily a good thing for your macroalgae. And the only one that we did that with specifically was with a certain um, subset of Calerpa. So if you are thinking, well, I have to have my lights on all the time, you may not need to. And there was a thing that people did a long time ago, and some people still do it now, but I don't hear it discussed very much, where they will light their refugium at night opposed to when the tank is dark. So in other words, they do reverse light schedule. And you've got your, your reef tank lit up all day long, and then at night, the reef tank is dark, but you have the refugium lit. And the idea or the principle behind it was that if you create photosynthesis at night, the plants will be using up CO2 and they'll be expelling oxygen into the water, which will help raise pH in the tank so the tank won't get quite as low during the night. So that was your way of competing with pH low, late at night. Now, I tried a couple of different bulbs back then, back in the day. And I do have this comparison on my website where I discussed, or where I, I, um, I did a test, where I took a, it's probably a 20 gallon long aquarium and I put a divider in the middle that was solid. And I put one type of light on one side and one type of light on the other. And then I put a power head blowing this way and I put a power head blowing this way and I put macroalgae here and macroalgae here. And I just wanted to see which would grow better. And on one of them, I had a 6,500 Kelvin bulb, which is very yellow and uh, considered daylight by most uh, brands. And then on the other side, I did 5,100 Kelvin, which was um, just not as daylight. It was just, I'm trying to, it had a little blue in it. And that, and these are just uh, compact fluorescent bulbs. They weren't LEDs. <laughs> we didn't have those back then. Um, and I just ran it, and one side grew like crazy, and the other did not. And so, but I mean, well, the other side grew, but didn't grow as well. And so from that point forward, I only used 5,100 Kelvin light bulbs. And that was what I recommended to everyone. And there was a bulb you could buy at Home Depot for like $10. And for another $5, you can get a cord with a socket and a clamp to like grab onto a PVC pipe or a piece of the two by four that your tank stand is made out of. And you could clamp that light right over the water and it would grow the plants and you could even take a sponge and wipe off the bulb when you got salt creep on it because it was it looked like a floodlight it was very convenient i really liked it and i highly recommended it and lots of people bought them uh, matter of fact i was buying them by the case 
So when our club members wanted them, I'd have them here and they could just get one from me instead of having to order one and pay for shipping. And so it helped save some money at that time. But uh, in the meantime, over the last, oh, I'd say 10 years, nine years, eight years, there's been a lot more push for like hot pink and purple and you know, just this, this glowing insane color that apparently works really well if you're trying to grow marijuana. <laughs> That's my guess. You know, it seems like everything that involves drugs will get translated into other groups as well. And so people are enjoying the hot pink look. I think it looks stupid. I hate it. I won't do it. I just can't stand it. And uh, I say I won't do it, but that's, there's a good chance that horrible color is inside my algae turf scrubber. I don't even know because it's closed up like a file cabinet, so I can't see it. But maybe there's some in there and I'm not aware of it, which is fine. As long as I don't have to look at it, I'm fine. I live on planet Earth. I don't live on Mars. It's not normal to be looking at things that are pink and red when it comes to growing plants. That just blows my mind. I just, ah. So I don't want to argue with you about it. That's just how I feel. I think it's stupid. Okay. <laughs> and I understand. Others are going to say, well, you're wrong and it grows faster. How fast do you really need your plants to grow? So let's talk about the refugium itself if you're setting one up. First of all, if you set up a brand new tank and you just got it through the cycle, that is the wrong time to set up a refugium because there's nothing in the system for the macroalgae to feed on. So I don't recommend that. I would tell you to wait four or five months of the tank running before you even set one up because you need some bio load for those plants to feed upon. They need the nutrients. And when you've got your brand new tank with your brand new sand and your brand new rock and everything was dry and you had some bacteria, and then you add a fish and a couple of mushroom corals and a leather or whatever. It's just not enough to grow macroalgae. So let's just pretend you bought a sump for your aquarium that has a refugium zone. Let's just start there. I usually recommend that the water flowing through the refugium is slow and that you have much more of the water draining down from your tank to go through the protein skimmer section for the protein skimmer to pull out the dissolved organic compounds or the docks. And if you would set it up that way, I feel like that's going to be much more successful than having a lot of water running through your refugium. And there are a lot of sumps that have been made for years and years and years where the water just drains in, goes into a sock, goes into the skimmer, goes to the refugium, goes to the return. And you can't control the flow going through the refugium. But there's more and more setups where the refugium is standalone. It's in its own little compartment by itself. It may have a feed that leads water to it. You may have to branch off your return pump to send water to the refugium. That's all fine. But you see, if you have those, that allows you to dictate how much water is going into that zone. If you increase the flow very highly, you're going to cause a lot of surface rippling. And when the water is really uh, cavitating and rippling hard, I find that light doesn't penetrate as well down into that area for those macroalgaes. So, and I, I had that experience for nine months when I had this huge glass sump and water was shooting through it at 3,000 gallons an hour and nothing would grow. Nothing. It was like, I cannot get enough light through here. And people are like, oh, well, if you put a whole bunch of T5s on there, it would grow. And I'm thinking, do I really want to spend a couple of hundred dollars in lighting when I can just slow down the flow and use my $10 bulb and grow macroalgae like I've always done it? And so, you know, I have always recommended lower flow. Just have water moving through it. You saw, uh, I did a reef diary recently where I cleaned off the scum off the surface of my refugium. Something was growing on there recently, I don't know why, and I just removed it. But you saw, I mean, the water wasn't like moving through quickly. It's actually very quiet and the plants continue to grow and grow and grow. Now that one that I'm, you know, that plant that's in mine is called Feather Calerpa, and I've just, that's the one I've never had a problem with. It's never tried to go sexual. I light it for about nine hours a day and uh, it just grows. And I pull out a big fistful every once in a while because somebody asked me for some. I try to remember to pull some out just for the point of culling to leave room for new growth and I tend to forget. And it's like, oh, it's like, oh yeah, I need to do that. <laughs> and it occurs to me, I should remove some. Now, why would you remove any of these plants if you're trying to grow it? The principle behind it is that you're growing the plants in there to use up nutrients in the water and by removing some and encouraging new growth it continues to absorb the nitrate and phosphate that's in your system it's using up the nutrients and it's utilizing it and then you rip it out and that encourages new growth like uh, i was watching inappropriate reefers he had a video today on instagram and he had this huge tall mangrove and he did a video probably two months ago where he had these huge uh, hedge choppers <laughs> And he went up to the tank and he's like, all right, guys, here we go. And I thought he was just going to go snip. <laughs> and he just went, yeah, and he chopped it so hard. 
that I totally expected that he chopped the power cord to the light and the entire video go dark, and it didn't. And I was like, oh man, I was really hoping you'd hit that, that light. <laughs> and he, he said, that would have been a good video. I was like, I know. <laughs> I mean, even it was totally fake. You know, he could just done like this, made the room go dark, and then he was like, oh, honey, I think I cut the power. So that would have been funny. But uh, his mangrove was really tall. He chopped off a huge section. And then today's video, he showed new growth coming out of the lower branches. And he said, look at the new leaf here, new leaf here, new leaf here. And it wasn't just like a leaf, it was like curling out because it's those lower branches were doing nothing and now they're encouraged. It's the same principle when you have catamorpha or you have calerpa in your refugium, you remove some, and then you need to kind of stretch the plants and pull them apart a little bit to encourage more flow through it, and you'll start to get more growth again. So I would recommend that at least once a month. Also, some people have found that they have better success when they're using certain additives. Uh, iron is one that plants like to use or utilize. So dosing iron, you don't want to overdose your reef, but you want to put in enough that it helps the plants continue to thrive. And uh, there's different things. I think Brightwell has something called uh, Kato Grow, which is a product design. It's probably got iron in it too. But so there's a few bottles on the market that you may choose to use. I've not had to do that ever for whatever reason, maybe because I'm already using Prodivio and, uh, you know, just my numbers are balanced through my salt mixes. I don't know, but I've just not had to put in another type of additive in my system uh, based on looking at my reef as well as watching how the plants grow as well as ICP tests coming back that show that everything's relatively where it needs to be. So I haven't seen like a massive deficiency of something where I needed to put something in. Now, some people will want to have a lot of flow in the refugium, but, you know, as I was saying before, I don't recommend having a lot, but sometimes you're in a situation where it's just, it's gross in there, it won't stay clean. You may want to put in some kind of a power head to move that water in a circle, not move water from the system through the refugium and out. You know, we don't want to cause turnover. We want to do internal circulation like we do with a reef tank. We have a return pump coming up and then we have all these gyres and vortex and wave pumps and all these different ones on the market that move the water in the display so that the water going down the drain doesn't have to move through at 10,000 gallons an hour. Instead, it can drain at, you know, 800 or 1,000 gallons an hour. And yet you can have 10,000 gallons an hour of water moving inside the aquarium. Same principle. But when you're putting some kind of a power head inside your refugium, you need to have a way to prevent the algae from getting sucked into the intake, which would clog up and make the pump no longer push water out. Also, you may be so inclined to say, oh, I'll just use this old power head I've always had. <laughs> so let me tell you a story. I, when I first got in the hobby, I you know, went and bought myself a 29 gallon and I got myself an under gravel filter and I got some penguin power heads and uh, I got a hang on back filter. And it was just a basic, basic setup and just a regular uh, fluorescent light bulb, you know, just the kit. And that penguin power head was with me for years. I mean, it was sort of like a precursor to the maxi jet. And I thought, oh, well, I need a little more flow into my refugium. This was under my 280 gallon reef. I had this huge refugium that uh, just was kind of looking stagnant and I wanted more water going in there. So I used the, the penguin power head. And then, I don't know, there was a time period where things weren't quite right in the tank. I was losing some corals and I couldn't understand why. And I did some checks and I, you know, everything was coming back normal, but I was still getting, you know, some STN, which means the corals were turning white near the base. You know, just things would just go up in smoke for no reason whatsoever. And you didn't, you didn't know why. And so I finally figured out I had stray voltage in the aquarium. I thought, okay, well, the way you determine stray voltage in the aquarium is to use a voltage meter or a volt meter. And uh, you want to put one probe in the water and the other probe on the ground. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> Someone's going to kill themselves because I said something wrong. Um, I have an article about this. Read the article. It's smarter than me just talking off the top of my head because I haven't done this in a long time. And when I need to do it, I go read my article. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm giving you the same advice I give myself. I, I try to document things so I later on look it up in case I forgot what I did to remind myself how I did it. Uh, so anyway, I checked for stray voltage and I had something like 49 volts in my system. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So the way you solve it is you unplug everything 
and then you plug in one thing and you check with the meter and see what your rating is in the number. And then if that one's fine, you unplug it and you plug the next thing in and you do it again. Or you can just systematically add a new thing and you keep working your way across. But the best way is to remove every single item and do one thing at a time. Check each heater, check each pump on your skimmer, check each power head, check each light, check each, you know, just whatever it is. One by one by one by one until you determine it. Well, that Penguin power head that was working just fine was leaking something like 45 of the 49 volts into the water. And I was like, are you kidding me? And uh, so I removed it and whole problem was solved. And I just used it because it still worked. And I didn't think that it could be doing something damaging to the system, but it actually was. And it was doing it very quietly. You know, I just, I was just annoyed that I had to throw away something that seemingly functioned. So keep that in mind. If you're grabbing something old, it may not be great for your system. Perhaps you want to get a new pump for that area, and then you're going to have to make some kind of a cage or basket or strainer. So it's just drawing in water, but it can't draw in the plants. And from time to time, because the way water works, water's moving, it's going to be drawing water into that power head, even through your strainer or your sponge or your screen, and you're going to have plants on there. So you have to clean off the screen from time to time to make sure that you have adequate flow so you can keep the turnover you're hoping to achieve inside that refugium zone. If the walls get dirty, you can scrape them clean. Just use a credit card or a scraper of some kind. Uh, if you are using a refugium as a display tank, you're going to use your little cleaning magnet on the front, and you can definitely chip away at the sides and the back so everything looks nice. And um, you could put in a few snails if you wanted to help keep things clean. Just remember, snails can become obstructions to flow. They could get in the way of that power head. They could get in the way of the water exiting. So you want to be careful and put up the appropriate protections in place so that your system can drain properly. And you don't have like, let's say you have water flowing in, you have a one inch bulkhead going out and the snail decides to go right into that hole and now the water's not draining out properly. As this thing overflows, will it overflow into another section of the sump and it's no big deal? Or will it cause a mess in your house that you have to go mop, you know, grab the mop? So you want to make sure that you've put some kind of an intake screen or some kind of a, uh, yeah. I think intake screen is the right definition. <laughs> there was a thing that used to be able to buy more easily and I'm sure it still exists. It's called perforated pipe. And it just looks like a plastic screen that's a complete circle, like a PVC pipe with a million holes. And you could cut off a section of it and put it over the top of a standpipe. And you'll see them in fish stores. So there's an aquarium, they got some fish in there, and there's a pipe standing straight up. And if you look at the surface of the water, there's this thing standing even higher. It's a screen. It just slides down over the top. It's a really nice way to keep snails and things out of the drain lines, cucumbers out of the drain lines. So you want to make sure that the drain can always drain. If it starts getting clogged up, you need to clean it as part of your regular maintenance so that water flows in and water flows out without any problems whatsoever to avoid a flood. If you're installing a brand new refugium like a standalone and not part of your sump, so basically it's a satellite tank as part of your system, and you may be putting it next to the aquarium, or you may be putting it a little bit lower than the aquarium. So maybe the tank goes into the refugium, the refugium drains into the sump, and then the sump pushes water back to the tank. So it becomes a satellite tank. In that situation, you're probably gonna use bulkheads. I would not try to set up some kind of a siphon system. I wouldn't use a power head to push water out of the tank into the refugium, and then a power head in the refugium into the sump because those things never work, ever, never. No, don't do it. You wanna have a bulkhead on the tank that drains and you want to go into that refugium, and then you want the refugium to have a drain, and it goes into the sump. And then you can do all the things you can do to make it quiet. But you've got to have, you've got to use gravity, not siphon, to make water move down. And uh, in this, the case of using bulkheads, make sure that you're only hand tightening them, whether it's a, an acrylic tank or a glass tank, because if you use a wrench, you'll crack it. There was a, a, a story that happened here at Frank's Tanks in his old store. He, uh, was setting up the store and people were all volunteering to help. You know, they just wanted to help. Hey, hey, Frank, I know how to do this. I can do it. And there was a plumber, a guy that does plumbing for a living. He says, Frank, I'll plumb all these tanks for you. So you don't have to think about it. And Frank's like, that's fantastic. Thank you. I can focus on building these stands. And he was doing his thing. The plumber was over here doing his thing. He installed all the bulkheads. And there was like 12 aquariums and he cracked like eight of them. And he's like, I don't know what's going on, Frank, but a lot of these tanks, you're going to have to get new ones because they're cracked. And Frank's like, what are you talking about? They're brand new. <laughs> And he was so mad. And uh, I remember that story and I was like, why would a plumber use a wrench on a bulkhead? 
and it's because that plumber is used to plumbing they're not used to aquariums and i don't know how he didn't know this but frank had to buy a whole bunch more aquariums he was not a happy camper and uh, he grumbled to me about that for a few times so rule of thumb hand tighten only if you have to use a wrench to remove a bulkhead that's okay but again you want to be very cautious and if you're under the tank trying to remove a bulkhead i'm just kind of diverging from the topic if you're under the aquarium trying to get a bulkhead out and you can't get anything up in that spot because there's no room it can be done with a long handled screwdriver and a hammer to tap the ring and try and drive the ring loose it's not easy you're gonna be under there there's gonna be some cussing <laughs> you're gonna get wet but you can remove one without breaking the tank you just have to be cautious and think about what you're doing but basically the bottom of the bulkhead is a plastic nut and by putting the screwdriver on the edge and then tapping, you kind of create like a little indentation in the nut. And that way the screwdriver will kind of stay and you tap, tap, tap until it starts to loosen. You don't have to use silicone with bulkheads. You just put them on. If you have a bulkhead that's leaking, let's say you're working on this project and this thing just keeps leaking. The cure is to actually, uh, and I'm talking about like inside an overflow box, okay? Let's say you have this overflow box inside the back of a tank. It's maybe it's a display, maybe it's the refugium, you know, whatever it is where water is collecting and then draining out. If it keeps dripping around the bulkhead because you can't seem to solve it, the solution is going to be loosen the bulkhead completely, take it out, grab a bucket of water, and pour it into the overflow and just let the water drain out and flush out all the sand and grit and anything that was in the bottom of the overflow box. And then put the bulkhead in and hand tighten it and you won't have a leak. Now, the cleanest way of doing that, because that sounds really messy, right, is you get a second person to help you, and their job is to hold the bucket underneath. And then you're on top pouring the bucket of water in. It flushes all that gunk out. Make sure that there's nothing on that bottom pane of usually what is glass. Sometimes it's acrylic, but a lot of people have glass. You want to make sure it's completely clean, just nothing. You feel it with your hand. It feels completely smooth. Then, you know, that person can take their bucket away with the water and get rid of it. And you can install the bulkhead. And usually I tell everyone to do this. Don't reuse a bulkhead if you don't have to. If you are at the point where you've removed a bulkhead, unless it's brand new. But I mean, if you, let's, you know, let's say I'm working on this tank. It's been running for eight years and my bulkhead starts to leak. I'm not going to try and take it apart and clean the bulkhead and put it back. It's eight years old. Buy a new bulkhead, put in a brand new one. If the tank is one year old, if the tank is six months old, if the tank is three years old, just replace the bulkhead with a new one. They're not that expensive. Depending on size, you'll probably be spending between five and $15 on a bulkhead. And you'll have a brand new rubber gasket. You'll put it in, hand tighten, won't crack. You don't have to worry about anything going wrong. So I, I really urge you not to reuse them unless you absolutely have to. Like for example, let's say the person that had the tank before you because you bought it used, they had a bulkhead in the bottom of the tank and they glued the plumbing in and you can't get it off. And you're like, well, I have to use it. Well, you don't have to, but I understand why you want to. In that situation, you can visually inspect it. You could even say, hey, I got a new gasket. I put that on there and you can put it in, but it may still fail you. Um, when I get a phone call, I think my mic is dead. <laughs> Terrifying. Terrifying. Um... Yeah, so we've covered the refusion itself and the bulkheads, the draining, not using a siphon. I mean, yeah, not using a, uh, a way of pumping it out or sucking on the tube and making some kind of a gravity system. You don't want to do that. You want water to drain out the bottom. We want to go through nice, clean, well-installed bulkheads, and then we go into our sump. And we've talked about flow rate through there. We've talked about lighting a little bit. I just want to emphasize, again, eight, nine hours a day is plenty of light for most plants. You don't have to do it forever. You can, um, you don't have to run your lights for a long day. And substrate. Some people like to know what to put in the bottom. And there's a lot of choices. Uh, some people want bare bottom. They just want to have just, they want to have a lot of flow. They don't want anything to gather on the bottom. And if there's detritus, they can vacuum it out, which they could, but I don't know very many people that do, but they can because there's that attachment that goes on the maxi jet or the CJ pump, which lets you actually vacuum the bottom of your refugium or your sump. So that'd be practical. I prefer to have like an inch of sand in the bottom. I don't recommend a deep sand bed in that zone because it's such a small footprint, it won't be beneficial. It won't do a deep sand bed job. So just an inch of sand in the bottom is fine. That's enough for the worms to live in, the pods to run around in. Um, you might put a cucumber down there if you feel like there's enough food to keep it alive. But uh, yeah, 
and then you know like i said if you're not using any kind of powerhead that sand's not going to move anyway some people think should i use miracle mud or um, fiji gold which is another one from walt smith industries uh, i've never really been impressed with miracle mud i just use regular sand just i mean you know aquarium sand not home depot sand <laughs> so you can put in that inch of sand then you can add some macroalgae and here's the next thing that i feel like maybe a problem for a lot of people trying to grow a refugium they have like i said they have this big zone i'm gonna say it's like this big by this big or let's say it's this wide and it's like this deep and you can you can see the rest of the sump in the background you can see the protein skimmer in the corner of the edge you can see the light above and it seems like it's great but there's like this little tiny golf ball bit of plant there's not enough to grow i mean yes that's a seed but it's not enough and I have actually been very disappointed to see how how little macroalgae you get when you order it online. And I don't know. I don't, I've never ordered online. I've never had to buy any. You know, if I needed some, back in the day, I went to the fish store and bought some. I got a fistful. And I have seen a few posts. So my, my uh, knowledge is biased <laughs> only because I've only seen a few posts. But people would show me like a white paper towel with like three blades of some type of plant and they said yeah it cost me twenty dollars i'm like for that are you kidding me that's nothing <laughs> i'm just wow really and you know maybe the vendor wants to make sure he has enough for everyone mm, i don't know but that just blows me away i just can't i can't imagine that so anyway if you're trying to set up a system and you can only get a few blades you're gonna need to buy a lot of blades <laughs> to put in some mass in your system so you have something to grow because just a little handful is not enough. A golf ball worth, a frag plug worth is not gonna cut it. You need some algae. And when I give people, you know, a Ziploc bag full, I mean, it's a it's a little brick of it. You know, there's a bunch of stuff in there. I had someone recently just asked for some. Matter of fact, somebody asked me if I could ship some and I forget who it is. And so if you're watching this video, please send me another email because I didn't know who I was supposed to be doing that with because I was gonna ship him some overnight. But uh, you, you need to get a decent amount and hopefully you can get some from your local fish store that's your best bet honestly I, because you can see what's happening you can say hey can i have some more <laughs> and you can actually get the right amount because if you, like i said just a little bit it's just not going to do it it's not going to do anything and you may just wither away and you're like oh nothing works in here and it could be it was a little tiny bit much too much light no flow at all down to the bottom and it just can't make it so we want to find the right balance but you need to have a decent amount in there in the first place to have any kind of luck um you can definitely add pods to that zone and you can just buy them by the bottle uh, there's different brands of uh of uh pods you can purchase there's uh, algae barn there is pods are us or pod your reef pod your reef and then there's of course reef nutrition these are all brands of uh that have different kinds of copepods you can purchase and you can just pour them right into the refugium. That's the best spot to pour them because they will go in there and they'll migrate into all the plants and they'll go into the sand bed and all that. And then if you can keep them alive by having a healthy, uh, a healthy bio system, just where everything is working well in your system and it's not struggling and starving, if it's going well, if your whole tank is doing well, adding those pods, they will very likely do very well. You will probably need to add phytoplankton to your tank every couple of days because the pods, the copepods will be eating phytoplankton. They need it. So putting that in your system is going to be part of the equation. Um, Reef Enhance is another way to encourage your pod population. I remember when I was talking with Tulio at, over at Reef Bright, who makes that product, he says, Mark, do you like pods? I goes, yeah. And he goes, use Reef Enhance. And I was like, okay. He goes, you like a lot of pods? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, use a lot of Reef Enhance. <laughs> I was like, wow, you're really selling me on this stuff. And he's like, I'm telling you, if you like pods, use Reef Enhance. I was like, okay, thank you. So I have put some in my tank occasionally, but I don't think of it like he does. And so I've not done anything insane to where I have millions of pods. But when I get on my stomach and I look in my refugium or when I look in the clown, uh, in the anemone cube with all the clownfish, there's no predators there. There's actually pods all over the place. So while I may not see them in this reef behind me, I'm definitely seeing them in the refugium zone and I'm seeing them in the cube and they're all tied together to the same system. So as new pods are born and get flushed through the system and pumped up into the tank, they are just live food for the aquarium. Can you put other fish 
or you know things that are in timeout inside your refugium, I would recommend you don't. A lot of times people think, well, I bought this flame angel because I was told it's reef safe and it's eating all my corals. And so I put it in my refugium. Well, I wouldn't have put it there because it'll devour all the pods and wipe out that entire population in no time because there's no real food down there. So what's this thing going to do? It's swimming around looking for, for food all day long. It's just going to devour it all. I would rather see you put it in the return zone of your sump, assuming that there's a screen to protect it from the return pump, and then get it to the next person the next day. You know, I, I wouldn't leave it down in your sump for a, a period at all. It's just like, oh, this fish is naughty. I got to remove it, but it's got to be, you know, you got to find a home for it immediately. But if you put any kind of predators inside the refugium, you are defeating the whole purpose of what that thing is. So we definitely want to be aware of what's going in there and uh, act accordingly. All right. I think that's it for refugiums. I don't really have anything else to say about it. So let's... Uh, Let's start doing questions. Question and answer period. That's always fun. The uh, the thing is you should always type at Mila's Reef when you're asking your questions as part of the question so I can find it. And uh, I will do my best to uh, answer your questions here now. Oh. So, George says, cyanobacteria in the sump, but not on the display, but some coral in the display are not looking good. Any ideas? Well, if you have cyanobacteria anywhere in your system that's visible, you probably want to treat the tank to remove it before it grows into an abundant situation. So while it's just small and you have a patch here, like I did, uh, back in uh, day 16 of, or no, probably day 13 of my reef diary, I mentioned how I had some pink right here between the sand and the glass. There was like a pink haze, just a little bit. And I definitely had some cyano growing inside the refugium. And I had uh, cyanobacteria like crazy inside the algae turf scrubber. So I treated the tank to kill the cyano before I had blankets of it in my display tank and got rid of it. And it was gone. Three days later, it was gone. So I don't recommend letting it live in there. And if you are trying to keep a tidy refugium and you're scooping off the surface and you're scrubbing on the walls, you usually won't have cyano happen in there. Uh, Ruben says, hello from CT. How are the corals doing that you receive from friends and vendors? Everything's doing well. There is no ugly surprises. <laughs> day after day, they just keep growing. It's, it's looking really nice. I know the reef looks a little bit out of focus. The uh, camera likes to do its own thing here. But uh, all that's new growth on that acropora over there. Right there. And... Uh, this right here is an ugly little spot. I'm actually going to break these off. These are leftover of a uh, yellow scroll coral. Turbinaria, I believe is correct. And there's a patch of life on both pieces. But the big skeleton is like ugly, green, hideous. I want to put it through a saw and trim off the good part and get rid of all the rest. I got a big, beautiful monty in the back that is going to go right in that spot. It's going to look much better there next week or, you know, the next time I do a live stream. But uh, no, lots of new growth. Everything I've gotten has done fine. You know, it's done well. There's no surprises. I'm, uh, I just need to get in there and start gluing things down in certain spots and get them organized. And I've just been working as much as I, I my days are full. A uh, matter of fact, this I didn't share anywhere. So you're the first ones to find out about this. Thursday, I was, uh, about to pack a bunch of orders for customers that had to go out. These people have been waiting and I was like, let me get this knocked out today. And I do all my box construction in the workshop where Minion is, which is my big CNC machine. Because I have this huge table, I can lay a four by eight shade of cardboard out and actually make the boxes that fit the products that are going out. Because usually the boxes I have don't fit the custom acrylic work I do. So I walk in there and all I smell is the smell of burning electricity. And I'm just like, what is that smell? What is going on? And so my, my brain immediately says, it's the batteries for the battery backup. Something went wrong. So I, I look at the charger that goes to the, f the bank of four batteries and I unplug it. And I'm looking around the room and I'm thinking, could it be anything else? And I'm like, no, it's gotta be these batteries. It's gotta be this, you know, it has to be. And I texted Mike who helped me install it. I said, hey Mike, I think there's a problem here. And he said, well, you know, what is your little 
button say when you press it on the little display. So I went inside the fish room and pushed the button and I said, well, it says 14.4 14 .4 volts. And he says, well, then it's working fine. And I was like, oh yeah. And that means the fuse didn't blow because I'm still getting voltage through the wire in the fish room. So I was like, I don't know, there's something's not right. But now my nose is full of the smell. I can't find the source anymore. And I tried going outside and I tried, you know, it just wasn't working. So instead I did something else for about 30 minutes inside here. And then I went back in there again and that smell was so strong. I was like, oh my God, it's definitely not the batteries because I unplugged that. So I looked at the UPS that's under Minion. The UPS is a un uninterrupted power supply for the computer that talks to the CNC machine. I thought maybe it's got a problem because you know, there's acrylic shavings down there. And even though all the outlets have like the child protective caps in them, things break, you know, doesn't smell of anything. So I smell the actual PC tower. Doesn't smell like anything. I smell the monitor because it's electronics burning. I don't smell anything. And I'm like, could it be the AC unit? You know I mean? I don't know, it's blowing cold air and I'm sniffing around it. And it's like, the smell is there, but it's, I don't think it's coming from this. And then I get near the water heater and I'm thinking, you know, I actually think it's where the power goes into the water heater. You know, there's this huge heater, two copper pipes coming up and then there's the pressure relief valve. And then there's this big, huge wire that goes in and there's like a little plate that you take a screw off and you can open it up to see where the wire nuts are. So I'm like, I think this is the spot. And I went ahead and killed the power to the water heater, turned off the breaker. And then I opened up that plate and inside it is just completely cooked. All the wires are just like melted into a mass. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, first of all, I never touched that thing. I don't remember the last time I did touch it. <laughs> so that's weird. And I called, you know, a couple different people that day that you know, have helped me with things at the house. And Mike was one of the ones that helped me, Bobby was the other one. And we uh, discussed, you know, what was going on. And I was able to basically cut off all the bad wiring. And there was still enough wire left over. I could just, you know, open up a, a what do you call it? Strip the end of it to get it fresh, a fresh connection. And then the wire coming down to the water heater, there was enough slack in it as well. So I could bring it together with all new connections. And I went ahead and I you know, tied it all together and I have hot water again. But uh, that took a few hours to get sorted out and I got nothing done but dealing with a electrical fire or electrical smoldering. I don't know what you call it, but I was lucky I caught it when I did. I don't know why it happened. I, uh, I like to think the water heater is trying to kill me, but I don't know why. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what I did to offend it. So um, that was handled. So all day Friday, I packed orders galore. I mean, I packed so many orders. I got a bunch of acrylic orders out. I'm really happy about that because my whole list of people waiting cut in half because I got those gone. And uh, they were all dropped off before, and before the deadline. I mean, it was like the last minute I got everything dropped off just in time and nick of time. So um, yeah, I didn't tell anyone about that except uh, the people that were involved. Uh, John says, is dosing aminos into my sump as good as dosing into the display tank? Technically it is. As long as you know where you're dosing it, it is getting into the return pump to, you know, mixing into the water column. The one thing I would recommend if you're going to dose anything, like, you know, I was dosing potassium. I put mine on top of the tank. I was trying to make sure it goes right into my display tank, which is really overkill because everything else gets dosed into the sump. The magnesium does, the calcium reactor does, <laughs> everything's happening down there. But I just did that one up there. But uh, if you can put a small power head, just a little tiny guy in there to make the water go in a circle under where the water's dripping in from the dosing pumps, then as the drop hits the water, it's circulating and mixing, right? So as it's trickling in, drip, 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 or trickle, 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 or flow, flow, flow. But as the water's moving in a circle, it is immediately mixing up and then it's being drawn into the return pump and going into your, into your display tank. If you don't have a little tiny power head in there creating that type of circulation, what you'll usually end up seeing is a lot of like milky uh, uh, calcification on the walls or on the bottom of the sump. It's just like this white stuff. You're like, what is this? And why is it only in this area? It's because the stuff is just dropping to the bottom and just turning solid and being wasted. It's not doing what you need because it never got mixed into the water column itself. So I would definitely recommend a little tiny power head. Those itty bitty ones like, uh, I don't know. How about this guy? 
a Voyager Nano. That would work. And this holds on magnetically. You can just hold it on to wherever you want in the sump and just put it down low, let it move the water. Some people actually put things like this in their sump in various zones. So any detritus that tries to land stays in the water column. And that way the protein skimmer can capture it. And uh, it just, the bottom of the sump stays clean, but I don't. Uh, but when I'm dosing with like liquid dripping down, mine actually dripped down right above the power, the uh, intake of the, uh, the um, Abyss return pump. I uh, have the tubes coming down or coming across and then I zip tied them to the return line <laughs> and the tube just sits there and does this as the pump is running and it's spattering the liquid directly over the area where the return pump is sucking in water. And I've had no weird buildups on the bottom of the sump or anything like that. So I know it's working. But if you don't have anything like that, you know, the ability to do something that convenient, then your next bet would either be have it dose up into the top of the tank with some kind of rig that holds all the tubing nice and cleanly or put a small power head down below. Aftershock says, I'm sick of my Flipper Max scratching my tank. Could you please suggest something strong for 12 millimeter glass, but also safe for my 450 gallon reef? Uh, I understand your feelings. I would say, I mean, I like the, the oh, where are they? The algae float magnets. I love these things. I've been using them for years and years and years. They don't scrape, but they definitely scrub. So this one here, my tank is, um, three quarter inch glass. This is a tiger shark float. They're very expensive. I believe these things cost something like $80 a piece and I've had it forever. And the nice thing is after a while, when the pads get worn out, you can just peel them off and put new ones on. They let you buy uh, replacement pads. So the replacement felt for the dry side and the replacement scrubby, which looks like Velcro for the inside, you put them on the two halves and you keep going on with your life. Now, eventually a magnet may fail on you and the, the case is, allowing water in and the magnet within can be rusting, which could affect your reef. So don't be like, I've had this for 20 years. I'm going to have it for another 20. I mean, things will fail at some point, but I really do like that for cleaning. And then uh, I mentioned the little scraper from Amazon that I've been using for hand scrubbing. And then I have this other thing that I've been doing forever. which I don't even know if they sell them anymore, but I have one backup. So this is a mag float. Then I have this thing on here called the Easy Blade. It's glued on forever. And then this is the blade itself. And it says Handy 70 on it. And it's a double-edged blade. And I've used this on several videos to show you guys what it looks like. And I love using this in my tank. So you just put the blade on top of the plastic apparatus. You adjust, it can adjust back and forward. I don't know why you'd ever adjust it. I always have it forward, but I, I don't know why. Maybe there's a reason why it should be adjustable. Maybe depending how you glued it on or something. And then I'll use this on the inside of the tank and I put the other part on the outside and I will scrape everywhere on my tank and it doesn't scratch my glass. And I use, I have Starfire glass. I use this on the anemone cube. I use this on the reef. I don't use it on anything acrylic. And uh, the easy blade is awesome. I mean, I just, I really like it and uh, it gets into all the nooks and crannies. I love to work down here by the sand bed and get this little bit of algae that's right here that always builds up, that little bit of film gets in the corners where a cleaning magnet can't. And I can use that on the three eighths glass and I can use it on the three quarter glass. You know, it has just enough strength to hold together. Uh, I'm lucky in that regard. If it was uh, anything different, I might have to go with something else. But that's what I've been using for probably 15 years. <laughs> so it's what I recommend. But you, you may find that you need something for one size tank. You need the same thing made for a larger tank. Like you said, you know, I've got a 12 millimeter glass tank and you got a 450 gallon tank that might be uh, one inch glass or something. I don't even know. Whatever that is, that could be 25 millimeters. I don't know. Look at these comments. Mike says he's about to set up a refugium. He wanted to know the best way. Well, there's obviously given me a lot of information on the web. You know, some of the things I talked about today should help you a bunch just with the basics. Oh, one thing I didn't mention, 
the light that's over your refugium, most lights, we don't want them to get wet. Some of them are made to get wet. Tunzi has one that you can literally put underwater and shine at any angle because it uses a magnet to hold it in place. That's kind of neat, right? Uh, the new grow light from uh, Neptune Systems, I think it can get wet. <laughs> Why? Why would I want to get it wet? Anyway, I usually recommend that when you put in your light over the refugium zone, you want to make sure that if the sump filled or the zone filled all the way up with water or even the sump filled up with water, that the maximum height water can be, the light won't get wet. If, if the sump is overflowing, your light should not be in the water with electricity, is my point. So I always recommend having it up just a little bit higher than the water line to avoid any kind of damage to the light fixture itself or to causing an electrical hazard. Also, one thing I didn't mention that um, might be worthy of consideration is a lot of times people want to have different color baffles because of the refuge. They want to trap the light and light will shine down from the light fixture into that area and it'll bounce off the walls and come back in and it could bounce off the bottom and go back up. I mean, because it just depends if you have a bare bottom or if you have sand in there. But when you are bouncing the light around in there, you still have coralline algae happening over here and you have the inside of the protein skimmer getting full of algae. That's because of the light in the air, not the light in the refugium. The light down in there is ricocheting around inside the box. It's not going everywhere. I promise you, I know you don't believe me, but I'm telling you that it is in the refugium. It's the light transmitting through the air that is hitting all your other stuff. And that is what you want to take care of and you want to block it or shield it, create some kind of a shadow box, some kind of way to keep the light within that one zone something that you can work around and it's not in your way or that you can lift out of the way when you need to get into the sump and then you can put it right back into place to trap the light so your stuff stays clean in my situation i haven't made anything to trap my light like i should have and so i have to every once in a while take out the calcium reactor and clean the inside of it and then you saw recently i cleaned the protein skimmer of all the stuff that was growing in there and that's all light related so it's just and you know what i mean you can't stop all the light unless you have a completely enclosed uh uh, filtration system because even in this situation I have light come off the frag tank that is shining on one side of the protein skimmer so even if I had a light shielding the refugium light I've got the uh, XR15's shining light straight in and getting coralline algae growing inside the protein skimmer on the other side also the light from the from the LEDs from the skies that are over the top of my reef that hits the back wall and comes down <laughs> inside the fish room and that also makes uh, coralline grow on the front of the glass and I, I'm sorry the front of the the sump where I, I work and access it and I'm having to wipe things off so there's no way to have an absolute light light vacuum you're gonna have to have some light in there unless you've got it completely enclosed like I said to where it's all in cabinets it's all dark all the time except for that one zone and then you would want to put shields up around the area in the air to make the light shine down but not leak out everywhere else And then Bradley said that he is actually growing zinnia in his, and it's going to take a while to populate, but it seems to be working. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Man, I haven't heard about anyone doing that in like a decade. Uh, don't, no, not sure how to say this. Gertjen says his Kato doesn't tumble, and he gets five hours of light a day. Um, and it's growing like crazy. That's good. See? So it doesn't have to be a long light period, guys. Okay, let's talk about what happens if something goes wrong with your plants. We didn't even address that. Uh, Alex says, how much par for Catomorpha and Calorpa is red light better for growth? Um, I don't know the answer for the par, but I'm going to guess somewhere between 100 and 150. Okay, that's just a ballpark guess. The thing that happens sometimes is that people will put in plants in their refugium and they put on this light and it might be a very intense light and the, all the tops of their plants turn white. They just burn. They don't grow. They, they lose all their color. And you're like, what is happening? It's probably, I mean, that's where I feel like there's too much intensity. Um, there's too long a duration of light. And so by shortening the time period, you may solve the problem or lifting the light up higher off the water could be the other solution. So if you do have parts of the plants that are dying off, you're going to have to remove them because as they die off, they rot. They add to the negative 
uh, situation in your entire ecosystem and they can you know cause detrimental problems so we want to remove what's de decaying or dying and we want to stick with what's still alive and doing well so if I had like a big section of macroalgae that was dying I'd remove that and I'd focus on the good stuff that's doing well it's sort of like fragging I guess right and that way you can go ahead and you can adjust your lighting maybe like I said it, maybe you're running your lights a little too long and you want to shorten that or like I said lift them up higher and that way you can to you can take care of the situation. Also, something you could do manually from time to time is literally take your plants and flip them over so that the other side gets some light for a while. And that way uh, you're kind of evening out the, the light distribution throughout all the macro. Uh, Virchil says, I've been trying to make a sump for the last three days. I've used three bottles of silicone, but the refugium section continues to leak. Did you make the entire thing out of glass or are you using glass and acrylic? Because if the acrylic or the glass, you know, like the dividers are too thin, they will bow and they'll pull away from the walls and they'll pull right out of the silicone. So we want to make sure that you have the right thickness of material and the right uh, width of material that fits within the walls of the sump you're trying to build. Okay, so, nice. So you said that the uh, tank and the baffles are made of glass. If everything's glass, this should go together very nicely. So if there's a leak, it's something to do with how you're putting the silicone in or you're not getting enough on the sides to create that nice barrier. Uh, your glass should not be glass on glass, should not be touching. There should be a gap so that when you squeeze the silicone in that it creates this bead and it's pushing between the wall and the baffle itself. So that way you have a, uh, a, some goo in between the two surfaces, right? And then you would take your finger after five minutes and you would smooth it, create a nice rounded side and do it on the other side the same way. And that way you'll get a nice good seal. And then you have to let it sit for about 24 to 48 hours before you add water. So if you added water too soon, the silicone wasn't ready and it, things are going to shift and move and it's going to weaken the silicone itself. Uh, Malcolm's Reef says, I tried to order a peacemaker. I've emailed you, but I'm not sure if you received them yet. Um, yes, we will talk. No problem. You can resend that email to me today. I will find it today and get back to you. I tend to not read emails on the weekends. I do all the YouTube stuff on the weekend, and I'm doing a diary every single day, and I kind of pull away from the computer. But um, sometimes some emails do not come through to me. Uh, usually I am on top of it. But if I miss one, just always resend, and that way I get a chance to see it again. Marshall said, is that a pajama cardinal behind you? If that's so, then that looks really nice. Yeah, there's five in there. I've had them for a very long time and they are humongous. Uh, Angus says, is there a, any way to remove a large scratch from a glass tank? I recently dragged a grain of sand with my cleaner magnet and caused the scratch. Nope, there's no solution. That's unfortunate. I mean, that's that's what we try to avoid. And uh, that's why people buy new tanks <laughs> because we get these scratches. The problem is once you have a scratch, that's where the algae grows first. It always grows in that crevice. And so when you're cleaning your glass, you'll have like this green line and you're like really trying to scrub that spot to get the algae out of that area. And when it grows back, it fills in the line first and then it gets the skin on the, on the rest of the glass and we're trying to remove that film algae again. It's, we all get a few scratches. We try our best not to. I actually got a few scratches from a couple of different products I was trying. One was a beta tester product and I put it in my tank and uh, it kept moving because the magnet wasn't strong enough because it was a prototype. And I put my huge cleaning magnet under it just to hold it up so I could test the thing. And then I, uh, when I was, I was fed up, I was like, that's it, I'm done. I'm not testing this thing anymore. I just took it out of my tank. 
it was this huge scratch where that thing had been moving and i was so mad i was like this thing scratched my tail <laughs> so, <laughs> and that scratch is still on the end of my tank to this day i, st I saw it today but uh yeah got to be super careful with your cleaning magnets not to pick up a grain of sand Alex says, what do you think about planted marine tanks? I don't know. Clint says, what's the best light for a refugium? I prefer daylight myself. My lighting over my tank is from, I mean, over my refugium is from Reef Bright. And it is a, um, <clears throat> what do you call it? It's a grow light for plants. And it's a combination of white and yellow. So it looks like what I'd see if I was looking in the sunlight. That's, it looks real to me. I prefer that over the crazy hot pink that so many people are leaning into these days. Uh, Mike says, would Calerpa serrolata, AKA the cactus tree algae, AKA serrated green seaweed be good for refugium service? Got some on some live rock and it grows like crazy, not sold by anyone in the US. Um, I think that's one of those invasive calerpas. So if it's in your refugium, that's okay, but you don't want any of it to sneak up. Now you said you got some in on the rock, so I'm assuming you're gonna take the rock and put it down in the refugium, which would solve the problem of letting it be in your system. If you ever have a problem with macroalgae migrating or getting into your main tank, you're gonna have to be on top of it regularly to get it out of the tank. And I never used any kind of chemical solutions. You know, back then we didn't have Flux RX or any of those products. But when I had Calerpa growing in my angle tank by the front door, it, that tank was, you know, about this wide. Well, how do I do this? It was this wide, this deep, and the front was sloped with like an opening that was maybe, you know, four inches across the top, maybe five inches. It was narrow. And so I'd have to reach my arm in there under the sloped wall to like pick off algae with uh, forceps. With tweezers and i'm removing the stupid calerpa over and over and over and it keeps growing back every week i'm ripping out as many as i can find and then every week it grows back again because it's calerpa <laughs> it's fast growing it's invasive and i you know regretted that some got in my tank and i have been pulling it out of my tank on a regular basis because i didn't want it in there i didn't want because i don't definitely didn't want it to spread and get everywhere so i'm ripping out the pieces putting them in a bowl and i'm doing this week after week and one day I don't remember what what the timeline was, but you know that tank ran for several years. But I remember one day I was ripping out the plants with my tweezers, and there was an emerald crab down there. And every time I ripped off a piece, he cut a little bit with his little claws. And I was like, "Huh." And so I pulled out some more, and he did some more, <laughs> and I did some more, and he did some more. I was like, "I'm starting to think he's learning this trick." And so I ripped out everything I could reach. And then I, I said, I'm, you know, because you get fed up. You're, you just get frustrated. You're like, oh, my, my neck hurts, my back hurts, whatever. And you stop because you can't stand it. But the emerald crab just kept going. And the next day, I saw two emerald crabs at one spot, and they got rid of all the last of it. It never came back. They finally got rid of the last of it. So I'm not saying you have to teach your emerald crabs how to do this, but that's exactly what happened in my tank many, many years ago. And it was great. And I never had Calerp in there again. So if you see some kind of an algae that doesn't belong in your tank, Yes, there are certain things that can eat it and consume it. Maybe you'll have a fish that likes to eat it, but won't eat every last crumb of it, but it'll pick at it and kind of keep it under control. Or maybe your cleanup crew will help to remove it, like urchins and emerald crabs and hermit crabs, you know, because that's what they do. They're constantly picking things clean. And then, uh, you know, manually, you got to remove some yourself. But if you have something really bad, and there's some stuff out there, like Dictyota is another one that's in the plant section of my creature ID. That's one you don't want in your display tank. There's a few of them that are really bad and we try to keep them out of there at, at all costs. And so when people tell me I'm growing such and such in my refugium and I take some out in a handful and feed it to my tangs in the display, I'm always thinking don't do that because the fish in your display don't fully digest that plant. They don't just turn it into a stringy poop. Sometimes they poop out some of the plant still intact and then that can take hold somewhere and start growing. But that's just my personal opinion. If you have been doing this and nothing bad has happened in your tank and it's you know, just no big deal and you're having a good time, keep having a good time. But there's a chance that that could go wrong one day. So, you know, like I have some ulva growing in my 
frag tank. I don't know why. I don't know where it came from. And it, it likes to really do its thing. And man, all I want to do is pull it out and give it to Spock. But I don't want Ulva in this tank. <laughs> so I'm resisting that urge. Andrew says, does copper absorb into acrylic? Will an acrylic quarantine tank absorb copper medication? It should not. I believe that the only thing that absorbs the uh, copper would be silicone. That's why glass tanks are usually made with silicone. And so you've got the silicone beads turn green from copper treatment. And if you have substrate in there, you know, sand or rock, those things will absorb the copper and you can't get it out of that enough to use it again. So in other words, if you're gonna use copper, we always have a hospital tank that's separate that is just used for medications, and that's where you would use your, uh, your copper treatment. But if your hospital tank is made of acrylic, you should not have a problem at all. Cajun says, is there, would you use a refugium or bio pellets for nitrate reduction? Probably bio pellets. Orca says, what's the best microalgae for a refugium? Well, I've been talking about macroalgae, so I don't really have a microalgae in mind. Uh, microalgae to me would be like green hair algae, and that grows better in a turf scrubber than it would in a refugium. I mean, it can grow down there, but I don't know if it'll grow enough to do some beneficial stuff or if it'll just become more ugliness that spreads throughout your system. Uh, Skull Squadron says, would you turn off UV sterilizer when dosing live rock enhance? Yes, for probably four or five hours. Odile says, can you grow copepods if you're running, I'm oh, sorry, if you are running ultraviolet light? Uh, UV light will only kill anything that passes over the light. So if you have copepods in the refugium, if you have copepods in the rockwork, if you have copepods in the overflow box, they're fine. But the ones that pass through the UV will die. Anything that goes through the UV dies, any bacteria. So if there's any bacteria in the water column, if there's phytoplankton in the water column, you know, any of those things that are going through, the UV would then get uh, murdered, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So if you were pouring in brand new copepods, you might want to turn off your UV until those copepods can get down inside the system. Uh, one thing you could do is like take a jar that you just got and you can wait till after lights out and you could lower the jar in the tank and basically pour it out near the rock work. That's one method or pour it out in the refugium, like I said, and then after 15, 20 minutes, then resume flow. And that way, whatever's there, they can grab onto things. Cause a lot of times the pods you get are so tiny, you can't even see them. You know, you get this jar with water and you hold up to the light and you can see, I don't know, 150 specs, but they say there's 5,280 pods in there. And you're like, okay, who counted these? <laughs> and how come I can't see the other 5,000? I see the 280, but I can't see the 5,000. They're so small, you can't even see them. And so by pouring them into an area with no flow temporarily, and then waiting 10 or 15 minutes for them to like settle, then you can start the flow again. You shouldn't lose that many as they blow into the next zone. Daniel says, I'm just starting a standalone refugium for a catamorpha production to feed a 250 gallon tank chock full of tangs. The display tank does not have a sump. Is a dedicated refugium viable? Well, yeah, I think it'll work. I mean, you're just talking about having a secondary ecosystem to grow macroalgae and it's gonna be using the nutrient load from your 250 gallon full of tangs. So I think that would work. Uh, Winder water, maybe? <laughs> Not sure how to say that name. It says, does carbon dosing affect the growth in the refugium? I've never noticed any problem with refugium growth at all when it came to any kind of dosing I've done. Jason says, do you still run bio pellets? No. When you run bio pellets, did it bring your nitrates down or just keep them down after bringing them down after a large water change, for example? Uh, when I ran them, it got the nitrates down. It took them down from high to low and you had to put in more bio, uh, I used biospheres um, as my, that was my preference. Of all the bio pellets, biospheres was my favorite. It's the one brand I actually carry in stock on my website because it didn't do the weird stuff that other ones do. 
and it would literally they would just kind of a reactor that was filled with bio pellets and then <coughs> over time it was less and less until it was like a few beads bounce around the bottom i remember my nitrates went up and i was like that's weird why are my nitrates up and i looked in the reactor and i couldn't find any pellets i was like where are they and i looked at the very bottom of the and you see like 15 beads bouncing around the bottom i was like wow okay i when did that happen i just totally forgot about these things so yeah you have to have enough in there to do the job it has to be a sufficient quantity you're also dosing bacteria but yes it will bring it down it's not water changes definitely will knock out the nitrate if you want to do ginormous water changes like i did earlier this year that is one method and uh, it will definitely work but if you're just trying to add something new to your system to work on nitrate control bio pellets will do it and you can set that up and they will do their job and if they're working well they will deplete if it's the same beads forever they're not doing anything it's just water moving through pellets cm thank you for saying you love the channel i appreciate that Uh, Varshil says, what is the best way to keep ammonia low in a new uncycled quarantine tank? Will a lot of keto work or help with this? Let me think about that question. A quarantine tank that's uncycled and you're trying to keep ammonia low. Okay, why are you doing this? I, I'm trying to understand it. You're going to cycle the quarantine tank, aren't you? That's the only thing I get. I mean, what are you going to do with this quarantine? You're going to put things in it, right? You need to cycle it. Uh, putting in macroalgae is not the solution for dealing with ammonia. If you have ammonia in there, that is the beginning of the cycle. If you're thinking, I've got a brand new tank, I threw water in it, I'm dropping in a bunch of fish, and they're peeing in the water and creating ammonia, can I throw macroalgae in there to fight the ammonia? No, that's not gonna work. You are gonna have to use some kind of ammonia quell, some kind of a detoxifier, to lock up the ammonia to protect the fish that are in the quarantine tank. But a quarantine tank should be set up in advance with active filtration, running carbon, with an ammonia alert badge inside to tell you what the ammonia level is in the water. And if there's no ammonia present, you're good. And if it starts to rise, you need to change more and more water until it's back down where it belongs. And the new fish you put in there, you're basically, when you put fish in a quarantine tank, you need to stay on top of that. And you may need to change 10% of the water every single day of that quarantine tank to stay ahead of it so it never builds up to the point where it becomes a problem. Because the fish are already, why are they in quarantine? They're in quarantine to help them be healthy and make sure they're not carrying disease so you can put them in your tank. But if you put them in there and the water is becoming more and more um, toxic and it's burning their gills, you're making the fish sick before it ever goes in your display tank. You're, it's going the wrong direction. So we wanna make sure our quarantine tank is fully cycled before you even put fish in there. And then once the fish are in there, you need to stay on top of feeding. You need to vacuum out the wasted food that was not consumed. You need to do a daily water change. And you do this for at least three weeks, you know, two to three weeks minimum for observation purposes. And then if you see a problem, then you have to move them into a hospital tank that was also cycled. <laughs> it needs to be, uh, as far as I know, I mean, I'm not a fish disease person. I've never pretended to be one. And I tell everyone, talk to humble fish. And you literally go to humble.fish and hit enter on your keyboard in your browser. And that website's all about fish disease. And he'll talk about quarantine tanks, hospital tanks, medications, and in-tank treatments. And he tells you everything. He's the source, not me. Uh, Rob says, I am growing cloves and pipe organs in my refugium. You know, there's things you can put in there for fun if you want to add some more diversity. First of all, there's lots of different types of macroalgae. You know, all I talked about today was just growing algae for the point of removing nitrate. But if you wanted to have this really cool refugium filled with uh, maiden's hair and barbata and calerpa and a little flame algae or dragon's breath, I mean, you can have these different ones in there and have a really cool looking, there's a guy I follow on Instagram I think it's Tiger Boy 2.0 or something like that. And he has all these little macroalgae tanks, like six or eight of them. And I remember he posted a picture of some elongated bubble algae. And he was saying, this is so cool looking. It's not your normal bubble algae. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I kept reading. And he says, I traded with another guy to get this from him. And I'm thinking, you're trading bubble algae? with? <laughs> I, I get it. 
we all have hobbies and we all have different things we love but this guy's into plants a little too much i love it it's hilarious it makes me laugh I, it's, i'm not against him at all i more power to him he has these beautiful little biotopes and if you had uh all these different macroalgae, you might want to put something fun in there like maybe sun corals that you could feed or maybe a pipefish or a seahorse because the flow in there is very slow you could have little clams down there the kind that are filter feeders not the kind that need light and you know assuming you could have enough food in the system to keep them fed because now we have the abundance of foods on the market and all the choices from reef nutrition is where i usually think first but there's so many choices you could use you should be able to keep pretty much anything alive inside a refugium zone if you're trying to make this interesting diversity and not just have a brick of Calerpa. Sally says, we bought a long tentacle anemone and freaked out when our cardinal fish was in it. Then I learned that's a thing. Yes, that's what they do. They, uh, Bengais will do that. Cardinal fish can do it. Clownfish definitely do it. And then there's some shrimp that will do that as well. They'll live inside anemones. Oh, that's great. So Arm had written me, and that's not the name he used, and he said, you know, his protein skimmer just would not cooperate. He'd been running for a whole month, and it just constantly was full. So I said, just put a bowl under it to lift it up like three inches and try to run it at its lowest setting and then see what happens. And then after a while, you may be able to remove the bowl and put it back where it normal. And that's exactly what happened. He says, it's skimming great now. I put it back down, took the bowl out, and it's all working like it should. So that's awesome. <laughs> Rob says, I'm pretty sure I recognize those Halloween decorations from last year. Not this one. I just got this one a week ago. Let's get a little light in there. And this one you didn't see before because it's been in the box for a couple of years. And I finally opened it up. And unfortunately, I'm so sad. I bought this at Comic-Con. But down here at her ankles, it's cracked on both legs. I mean, there must be wire through there because she's rigid, but it's broken. And I'm like, oh, it's never even seen the light of day and it's already broken. That kind of sucks. And this is like one of, it's one of those collector's things. So this one is number 964 of 3000 that were made. So this is poison ivy. I liked it because of all the pumpkins. Uh, okay. You guys and your nicknames. Big RCT YBFG. Can we buy a vowel? <laughs> <laughs> how do i go from a fowler tank to having some corals with instant ocean salt just want to have three or four anemones and some zoas i have three black ice clownfish and a 65 gallon display with a 20 gallon long sump all you gotta do is get your water parameters in control and you can start adding those things you're gonna need more flow in the tank because with a fowler you usually don't have much flow because it's just fish but you're gonna need more flow in the tank for the corals you're gonna need better light if you increase the light increase the flow Fix the water parameters. You can definitely put in the things you want to have because you already have half the stuff already set up. It's just we want to get water parameters to be reef parameters and not just fish only. And uh, in fish only systems, phosphates tend to be high, nitrates tend to be high. Uh, you usually don't care about calcium, magnesium, iodine, things like that. We care about all those when it comes to keeping corals and anemones alive. So that's why you need to get that all corrected. Uh, I talked about water parameters last week. It's a super long live stream, but if you go into the video's description, there's an article about water quality and you can just read that article and it's super long too but it's very detailed it gives you all the information the only thing it doesn't discuss is potassium but i'm going to add that paragraph at some point in the very near future to put in some information that i feel is pertinent to water quality but other than that if you can just get your water quality in check you can start adding some things to your tank and make it different than what it's been all this time uh senor gatos i don't have the answer for you but it's like i said before you want to go to humble.fish and get some help so i'm going to put this in the chat for you no actually i'll put it on the screen if i can figure out how to do that so see that 
stick that in your browser, literally in the address bar, type in humble period fish and hit enter. It takes you to this website. I really wish he would just buy the domain humblefish.com like everyone else has, but that is his website. So go there. And any of you with fish disease problems, go to humble.fish. Do it. <laughs> his name is Bobby. He has a lot of articles on there. He runs his own forum and he, his life's mission is to help people keep their fish healthy. So go to him. I'm gonna leave that up there for a little bit longer. I should stick something on the other side for me, right? Why don't I put this, whoops. Why don't I take this guy, ugh, cooperate. It won't let me do it. That thing is being a pain. Oh, I know why. Move this. Nope. <laughs> Wait, maybe because it's locked. There we go, I had it locked. I'm gonna stick this right here on the corner of the screen. For right now. So, if uh, you didn't know, I sell a lot of aquarium supplies, usually dry goods. I do some acrylic work too. Um, and I've been doing this for since 2009. So if there's anything you need for your aquarium, please check out my shop on millersreef.com. I do appreciate your business. It helps me feed the fish behind me. It lets me feed myself as well. And uh, I, as we head into the holiday seasons, I mean, we're, he we're coming up on Black Friday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all these different holidays are coming up. Some of you may have birthdays in the middle too, who knows? But uh, you know, if there's something you need for your tank, please look at my shop and see if there's something you can get for me. I'd appreciate it. If uh, during checkout, if the shipping seems high, just keep going because if there's if it if you overpay, I'll refund the difference. But we've got it really dialed in a lot of products, so a lot of the shipping has been coming back correctly. But occasionally someone gets something that's wrong and I just send them an email and let them know, here's your money back. And that way they aren't taken advantage of because I'm not trying to overcharge anyone when it comes to shipping. It's just what the website computes sometimes is a little high. Oh, Dusk is teaching me something. Here, I got to get rid of this so I can see what he said. Macroalgae means it has multiple cells. Micro is single celled. You can use micros like tetracelmus or isochrysis, but they're cultured separately. Well, see, that's when, okay, those things you're talking about are a type of phytoplankton to me. And where, when I think of macroalgae, I think of leaves and plants and weeds, you know, like that's why I've always thought macros were. And I was thinking micro would be, you know, like hair algae. Um, Bryopsis, these are things that are much finer in nature compared to, you know, Calerpa and Ketomorphin and larger based plants. I don't know, but uh, thank you for clarifying that because I was apparently incorrect. Macy's daddy, I haven't seen you in forever. And now I know why, it's because of all these conflicts you have on Saturdays. But I appreciate you do watch it and it, or you listen to them later. And Bill Clark has a good solution. I use a turkey baster to dispense the copepods directly into the rock work and sand bed when lights are dimming. It gives them an extra chance for survival. <laughs> You're right, that's true. Uh, CM made a suggestion about putting something in to eat up the ammonia in that quarantine tank. He said, he or she said, to put a piece of marine pure ceramic media that's been in an existing setup for a while into that quarantine tank. You can put in the hang on back filter with some floss to remove bits of food and change the floss each day. All right. Um, Tech HR says, is there a trick to relocating a pair of clownfish to another part of the tank? so they don't badger the other fish due to territorial issues. I tried moving the anemone that they were living in, but they stayed on the rock. <laughs> well, I uh, can't really tell you how to make fish stay in one part of your tank or move to a different part of the tank. If they were living with an anemone and you could move them as a trio to their new spot, that might've worked, but there's no guarantees. Uh, there's no guarantees of any of it. You could move all of that and the clowns may still go back and hang out near a powerhead 
and then the anemone decides, I hate this new spot, I loved it over there, and starts walking all over everything in your tank too. So it could be everything decides to go on strike and do whatever they want. But, you know, sometimes it works itself out. I um, have a pair of gobies in the anemone cube that live down at the bottom, and forever they were under the rock work, and Caitlin and I would grab flashlights and we'd go look for them each day to make sure they were okay. And they would be, you know, just back there. And they were fine, but they were hiding. And now every single day they're on the side of the tank in the exact same spot all the time. I love it. And all they need is a pistol shrimp. I have got to go pistol shrimp shopping because I want to get them one so they can be together and have a nice little hidey hole to live in. What they've done is the two of them have moved enough sand under a fungia to make a little depression and they stay near it. And every single night when I squirt food in to feed the clowns, I use a pipette. Now, you've probably seen it in some of the videos. I always squirt in. I don't just pour the food in onto that tank. And I will squirt in like eight, nine squirts of food, sending wave after wave of mice down, 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 trying to get some down to those two to make sure they get some food as well. They clearly are not starving, but I always worry that the clowns are devouring because there's 12 clowns in there and there's these two gobies at the bottom and there's three Ben guys. And I'm trying to make sure those two at the bottom that never come up definitely get their little bellies filled up as well. But I couldn't pick where they're gonna live. They chose where they want to live is the point of that story. And you're probably like, why did he even tell us that story? <laughs> uh, Aftershock says, I'm looking for an SPS or LPS coral I could keep in an area at the bottom of my tank shaded by a large Montipora cap. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I mean, sun corals go anywhere and they don't need light. They literally live in darkness, so they could be in the shade. Um, other Montes might be okay because they don't need a lot of light. So it just depends how much shade we're talking about. There's also Gargonians that could go down there. I can't imagine any kind of SPS doing well in, sh in total shade. So, like, I can't even say try It's just There's just not enough. I feel like you're talking about a dark spot. So... You may need to trim the Montipore a little bit back, too. But that's the suggestions I have. <laughs> Somebody wants one of my Kit Kats. I know! It looks like a Batman shape in the mouth of the uh, pumpkin. It's so funny. Once you see it, you can't ever not see it. It's, a Batman. <laughs> well, now I want a Kit Kat. Got me thinking about it. Bradley says, we're thinking about doing seahorses in a display refuge when we get the upgrade. Yeah, I've always thought a seahorse would be a good choice because there's no competition. They're not going to deplete the refugium of anything. They're cool to watch. The only thing is about seahorses, the general rule, as I recall it, is that whatever the height of your seahorse is, the tank needs to be three times its height. So if you had like an Erectus, which is the biggest one of the seahorses, I think those things get to be like seven or eight inches. You need a 24 inch tank so it can rise and go down. Seahorses don't do lateral swimming. They are vertical swimmers. So if you got cute little adorable seahorses, they could be in there and hanging on the plants and coming up for, just depends how tall your refugium is really. Another one that I thought would be cool in a refugium but there's a lack of uh, sand, it would be the garden eel. I always wanted to get one, but I've never done it. Because I've heard garden eels need 24 inches of sand to put their tail down inside of. Now, Frank's Tanks had a couple in his store, and he had like this much sand, and the eels seemed to be okay. But I don't think that's how you're supposed to do it. I mean, that's not the recommended way of taking care of them. Aftershock says, well, high calcium, that's over 500, cause cloudy water. Yeah, that could happen. It could be what you're seeing is precipitation. We want to make sure that our all of our levels are within the target area. And when one gets out of whack, something changes, and the water chemistry changes, and the tank can actually change its look. Rob says, what's your current wait time on larger sumps? I'd say eight weeks. Could be 12 shooting for aid. Providence Tidal Reef is here, everyone. But they got here near the end. 
Okay, enough about humble fish. Um, Mark says, would more live rock do the same as a refugium for phosphate and nitrate control? I can't seem to grow any catamorpha on my new tank now. Mark, your tank is new. That's part of the problem. Uh, I know you just set it up not too long ago, and there's probably just not enough stuff in the water for the catamorpha to grow. You may try some other macroalgae for now, such as Calerpa, or um, I don't know. There's a company in Florida that sells plants. And they're called lifeplants.com. And you could try them and look, they've got a whole list of different macroalgaes you can buy. And you may find something in there that would work well for you and could you know, do well in your tank. But uh, I don't think the answer is more live rock. I don't, I've never been able, I mean, think about this. There's been, um, People have been fighting phosphate and nitrate in their tank for years, and we used to fill our tanks with live rock. I mean, fill them. We would do a rock wall up the back to the surface, sometimes even out of the water, and we'd still have nitrate and phosphate issues. So having a lot of rock doesn't magically make those numbers go away. We do believe that deep within the rock, there is a denitrification principle in place, but when the levels are too high, it's more than it can take out. If they're low, it probably can take care of what's left perfectly well. Like, you're cooking in the kitchen, and there's a little bit of steam coming off the frying pan, and your venta hood's pulling it out. But if you really burn the heck out of something, and you've got smoke everywhere, the venta hood is not going to pull out fast enough. You have to open up doors and windows to really air out the room, because it's more than the venta hood can handle. Same principle. When we have too much of something, I mean, look, my tank had too much of nitrate for a super long time. And I finally had to really intercede to make a difference. But adding more rock would not have solved my problem, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Providence Tidal Reef says, You can have my pistol shrimp. He moves all my coral and buries the ones in the sand bed. If you want them, I'll send them, but they're a pain in the butt. Well, I don't want a huge giant one. And when we ordered ours from Live Aquaria last, uh, I guess, November... We got these fish that were about this big, and we got a pistol shrimp about this big. I mean, it was a tiny little guy, and he was so cute. And when he was dead, we were so sad. And we thought maybe he died in, because I left him in the tiny cup he came in inside the tank. So there was slits in the cup, and there was a whole bunch of sand, and the cap was on top, and I just didn't want to get lost. I didn't want it to just vanish. I wanted to keep it with the fish, so when we lowered it after a couple of days in the tank, we'd put the shrimp down there with the fish, and hopefully it'd stay together as a trio. And after the, but on that third day, I opened the cup and the shrimp was dead inside there. I was like, I can't believe it died. And then when we went shopping to Dallas North Aquarium, which um, was just an opportunity and we made a long trip to go there. We got in there and they had a pistol shrimp and it was about this big. I was like, okay. And we got that and put it in and it died like the next day. I was like, wow. And that's when Caitlin and I both agreed my nitrates are just too high. I mean, they just, we can't introduce any kind of invertebrates until those nitrates are down, which is one of the reasons why I did the reef reset earlier this year. I was like, I am at the point now where my reef is not doing well. I can't add anything new. The only things that live are things that have tolerated the water quality of what it is. And so I'm, I'm kind of limited in what I can look at for the rest of my life. So it was my goal this year to address that and handle it. And uh, so now I'm at the point where I can actually add some. But I don't want one that's a pain in the butt either. And uh, yeah, I guess it will bury a few things. There's, I'm kind of toying with the thought of making a very small extra tank to put in my um, walking dendros, maybe some sun corals. Um, I don't know, just some kind of a very simplistic little biotope that allow me to take care of the sun corals properly. And... Uh, I don't know where to put it or how to handle it or where I want to look at it, but it's on my kind of my wish list. So that may happen. You'll see. Uh, Keith was referring probably to the quarantine conversation, saying to use Seachem Prime and, and Safe work great every 48 hours. Yeah, you can add things like Prime to your quarantine tank or probably even your hospital tank when you're dealing with ammonia levels. 
But my the the original question that the person had posed was, can we put in ketomorphin there to handle the ammonia? And I was like, no, that's not going to do it. Uh, Gwunk says, have you ever used Harlequin shrimp as aster for Astorina starfish? I tried one and now he's gone MIA. Actually, I did. I bought a pair of them one time. One was blue and one was pink, so I assumed one was a boy and one was a girl. And I had a tank with like thousands of Astorina. And a couple of weeks later, I was like, wow, where are all the Astorinas? They are gone. And then I was like, wow, where are the Harlequin shrimp? <laughs> they were gone too. So that happened quicker than I expected. I did not know what was happening. Like I said, I thought this would be an ongoing thing for a while, but they depleted the Astorinas completely. And then I guess ran out of food and I lost them. I mean, I didn't even know. I'd never found a carcass of any kind. It's just like, they just vanished. So when you have a Harlequin, starfish, uh, Harlequin shrimp, you have to get a starfish to eat every single week. And some people will buy a starfish from the fish store and they will cut off one leg and they will give that to the shrimp like one leg a week or something to give it a, a diet to maintain for the rest of its life. Um, problem prone says I have a Borbonus Anthea says developed an, a Popeye and some sort of bubble around its eye. It's been three weeks and no progression. Should I attempt Reef Builder's eye surgery? I don't know if you should. I might talk to Humblefish and see what they say. Paul says, is there going to be a Club Mealers Reef meeting at Aquashella next weekend? I'm still deciding whether to fly over. Ah, uh, I don't know that there's a meeting planned. It actually didn't even occur to me until you just asked that question. Now I'm like, oh, that's a pretty smart idea. But uh, I do think it'll be a lot of fun. So maybe the presentation will be a Club Mealers Reef meeting. But uh, a lot of people have been posting online saying, will they be you know, live streaming or will they be sharing the talks? I don't think they ever do that. So I wouldn't count on that. That's you're supposed to go and attend it and be there. <laughs> Paul says, are you enjoying that Kit Kat? I only ate one because I had a mouthful of food. It's hard to talk when you're chewing. Uh, also asked, have you ever considered using Reef one part versus no, all for one, all for reef, the one part instead of your current method. No, I haven't. Um, he said that starting, he started using it, his coral seemed to love it. Because I have all my gear in place, I don't really need to change to some kind of a dosing system and have to keep buying all for one. I am a calcium reactor guy and I just dose potassium and magnesium and, and kind of keep my tank happy as best I can. I'm trying to keep it simple. I'm trying to avoid getting sucked into the whole reef moonshiners thing. Well, let me uh, answer the door. I'm going to put this on mute for a second if I can figure out where the mute button is. Be right All right, guys, the, uh, I got to wrap up the live stream. I got someone here that's working on the doors of the new building, and I have to go deal with that. So I hope you guys have a great weekend. Please remember today is water test Saturday. We want to test all of our water parameters to make sure that our tank is doing well because water tests save lives. I want to encourage you to do that testing and don't be lazy. Don't say my tank is fine. Just get out your test kits and use them because that is your job as a person maintaining a reef tank. <laughs> And uh, I will probably roll out something tonight, a 